gentlemen, brothers and sisters, all of you good folks, all of our guests, all of our friends, welcome, welcome, welcome tonight to the house of the Lord. Let's stand together and let's, uh, let's make a little noise unto the Lord. The Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Enter into his gates with praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's love him tonight. Hallelujah. Let's give him a good round of applause and worship. Come on, lift up your hands now and tell Jesus that you love him and you worship him. God, I worship you. You are the mighty God. Lord Jesus, you robed yourself in flesh and came down, Lord, to live among us, God, and to die for my sins. And, re and you rose again. Lord Jesus, so that I can raise from the deadness of sin and, and enter heaven with you. Bless us tonight as we worship you in song. In Jesus' name, worship with our singers tonight.
Are we glad that he loves us tonight? How many love him tonight? Can we love him right now? Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you, Jesus. God, for your goodness, your mercy. Amen. He's worthy of our highest praise. God, we're so thankful that you first loved us. God, before we were even formed in our mother's womb, you loved us, Lord. And we're so thankful for that tonight. And thinking of his love and his goodness, I'm going to take our needs to the Lord right now. If you have a need, if you can make it known by the lifting of your hand. A couple special needs I want to bring first off is Brother Matthew Playbo. He has been awfully sick the last couple weeks, and it turns out it's an inner ear infection. He's been suffering from vertigo and dizzy and stomach, all kinds of issues. And so I want you to keep Brother Matthew Claybo in your prayers. And also uh, received a text just a few moments ago from Sister Tarina uh, asking for prayer for Brother Danny. He's having some heart issues. And so and, and I, we could go, I could go on and on all night of different needs um, of people. And so I want us to take not only these special needs, but all the needs. You see the needs on the board tonight. Can we take just a few moments and let's take these needs to the Lord. We know he's, a, he's an answer, a prayer answering God. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening. God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy and grace. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. God, that when we call on you, you hear us, Lord. And right now, Lord, we lift all these names, all these needs to you tonight, God. Lord, we can't touch these people. We can't heal these people, but you can, mighty God. Lord, I'm praying right now. I'm praying for Matthew Clabo. Lord, that you would touch and heal his body, Lord. God, this infection, I pray that you would heal him right now, Lord. Allow him to be fully healed of this, God. Lord, I pray for Brother Danny. God, that you would touch his heart right now, whatever issues and concerns they're having, Lord. I pray that you would touch and heal him, Lord. Lord, every name you see on this board, Lord, I pray for our country right now. Lord, our country is in desperate need of revival, and we're lifting the U.S. up to you right now, Lord. God, we know that you can touch our country. We know that you can heal our land, Lord. God, I pray for every request, every family in this church right now, Lord. God, I pray for every person that has contracted this awful disease, Lord, that you would continue to touch and continue to work miracles, Lord. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for everything you're doing and everything you're going to do. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated this evening. So good to see everyone this evening. It's, I'm glad we're starting to, to venture back out and come back to church. I see many. It's probably the largest Wednesday night crowd we've had in several weeks. And uh, I thank you for being here this evening. So thankful for all that God is doing. Um, he has continued to touch, continue to bless, and continue to keep his hands upon his people. Amen. I want to, a uh, few announcements this evening before our ushers make their way. Uh, first and foremost is this coming Saturday, we are having special prayer for our country, calling it Praying for the USA, and that will take place right here uh, on our campus and our parking lot. I'm actually going to ask Pastor Triplett to make his way, and he's going to fill you in uh, on all the details of this, but this is going to be a tremendous effort, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. Thank you, Pastor Miller. Praise the Lord, everybody. We're so glad to see all of you tonight. I especially want to say welcome to uh, uh, Tom and Mary. God bless you. Good to see you back there, my friends. I want to uh, appreciate them so much. Love them. Uh, and I, I want to say Tom was here when we unloaded the steel for, the, for our new gymnasium back there. And, and Tom was the head man. He helped unload all that steel. He had experience in that. And uh, he happened to be here at just the right time. God knows how to send people at just the right moment. And uh, we appreciate him so very much. God bless you, Tom. Love you. Um, and, uh, but I want to I invite all of you uh, to come this coming Saturday at 6 p.m. We have uh, four Clinton churches that are going to be here. And I'm so excited about that, this. Um, uh, Pastor Spieth from the Wesleyan Church. Uh, Dr. Hickman, I believe it is, from uh, Black Oak Baptist. And uh, Pastor Miller and Eagle Bend Apostolic Church. And um, Brother Curtis Akers from the Church of God. Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful gathering uh, that's coming to pray for the USA. We will be doing our regular prayer uh, like we generally do, about a half an hour of prayer. But all of the 
All of these congregations are gathering with us, and I want all of you to come and help us to fill up this parking lot and lift up our voices uh, toward heaven and pray for our nation, which is in such desperate need of prayer at this moment. And God will hear, and He will answer prayer. Praise God. God does not answer prayers that are unprayed. If nobody prays for revival in the, in the USA, then we won't have it. But if we will pray, God will send revival. And prayers are going up, praise God. And they are having a mighty effect. And, and so I want to invite every one of you, please come. Please spread the word among our church people. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be outside. We're going to gather discreetly as families uh, so that everybody doesn't have to wear a mask and all of that stuff. And, and we're just going to have a wonderful time. Uh, we have a, uh, and we're going to we're going to have one song, and then we'll get busy praying. Uh, but I'm very excited, Sister Akers from the Clinton Church of God, who is li literally a, a nationally known a talent. She wins awards every year for her singing uh, in the Church of God. She's going to be singing a song to open up, and it's just going to be a wonderful time. So please come and be with us. Oh, it was. Uh, I wanted to tell you, I was so excited. I, w I went to Second Baptist yesterday on another errand and, and told them about, uh, about this meeting. And uh, they said, you know, this has never happened in Clinton before. I've been here almost 40 years, and I do not ever remember uh, of a church, of several churches gathering for prayer like this. And so praise God. God is doing great things, and we're very excited. Praise God. Come and help us this Saturday. God bless you. Amen. When you arrive on Saturday, uh, just to kind of explain our process, the main entrance will be blocked off. Uh, that is because we will be gathering in the lower parking lot and praying down there. So when you come in, you'll actually come in this rear drive. So we'll all be parking in the upper part of the parking lot, praying in the lower park parking lot. Um, and this is rain or shine. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it rains, what we'll do is we actually have an FM transmitter ordered. If it rains, we'll sit in our cars and pray. And, uh, we'll, and you'll be able to turn on your radio <laughs> and uh, listen to everything. So, uh, so anyways, we'll, we'll make it work one way or another. And excited uh, about all that God is doing. We also hope to see everyone here this coming Sunday. Uh, at 1130, this is a fifth Sunday, so we will not be having Sunday school this coming Sunday. It is a fifth Sunday. Um, however, it is also our promotion Sunday, and so we will be honoring all of our Sunday school teachers, Sunday school staff, nursery workers. Um, we, we have a, a, a list of people we will be honoring, uh, as well as promoting all of our kids uh, that are moving, aging out of one Sunday school class to another. And so we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a special gift for all of our kids that come. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. We've been uh, planning and, and, and plotting uh, most of this week about it. And I think Ralph's going to show up. And so we're going to have a good time. So we hope all of you will come out Sunday at 1130. And also next Wednesday, next Wednesday as we enter into September, we will be starting uh, our classes back. And so next Wednesday we'll have Toddle Church and the nursery and all of our classes back as we've been doing uh, prior to this month. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get back into a little bit of a routine. Is that all right? <laughs> Amen. Excited uh, about all that God is doing and uh, for what he's going to do. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to make their way right now. I'm going to ask them to put our offering prayer and ask you to stand one more time if you would. And we're going to pray over offering, and I want you to, to pray this with us this evening. If you would, lift your hand, and let's pray this together now. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given back to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. 
my whole family saved and walking with God. Perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Amen. Amen. We invite you to march and give your tithes and offering this evening under the direction of our ushers as the music plays at this time. giving this evening thank you all for being here once again this evening and like I said next week we'll we'll get back to dismissing classes and uh, I know many have been missing that this this past month I'm excited to get back to that uh, as many of you know last last week we finished up our series in Jude and so the last uh, few months we've gone through James and then through Jude um, and how many of you have been, have been, have been enjoying the, the Bible studies? Even if you haven't, just raise your hand right now and nod, nod smile real big. Good, good. I'm glad. I'm, that makes me feel a lot better. I've been wondering. Sometimes it's hard to tell. You know, I'm teaching and I look down and everybody's like. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I've been enjoying uh, going through God's word and, and continuing to have my faith built. Uh, we know that the building of our faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And when we can come in and hear his word, then our, we can leave with our faith built. And so we went through James and we have gone through Jude. And um, as most of you know, James and Jude, both of these letters were written uh, to churches with concerns addressing issues. That's what James uh, was addressing several things. And Jude had some very similar concerns. Jude, his main focus was on false prophets being able to identify false prophets that are coming into the church. And, and, and once again, this was back in 65 AD. So even in the first century church, they were still fighting issues that we fight today. Uh, there were so many things and we look at, uh, as you go through the New Testament, you think, wow, they, they struggled with those things even, even thousands of years ago. We still struggle with those things. And that's because we still struggle against the same enemy. It's the same, same devil they fought then is the same devil we fight now. <laughs> He may change his tactics, but it's the same spirit. It's the same sin. It's the same things that we fight, maybe just packaged a little differently. And so uh, in, in considering what, what direction to go next, um, I, have, I feel that as far as just looking at everything going on, especially in our world and all that, is, that, that we're seeing, um, it, it seems like every time you turn on the news, something else has, has ignited another ride, another city has burned down. And, um, and I don't know if you know this, but we're, we're fighting more than just flesh and blood. We're fighting spiritual wickedness in high places. And so as I began to look and, and think, I, I felt uh, led of the Lord to go to the book of Ephesians. And uh, Ephesians um, is, is the church in Ephesus is made up of a church uh, of, of pardoned rebels, if you will. Uh, and they reflect God's new, new creation. And this church modeled, you know, God's reconciliation and his peace. 
the church in Ephesians, Paul's letter to Ephesians wasn't a letter of rebuke and, and saying, you need to get this right and this is what's going on. His letter was more out of, uh, out of concern for, for letting them know this is the operation of the church. You know, y'all were doing good and, don't, and just, you know, keep, don't, don't forget <laughs> what we're fighting for. Don't forget the role of the church. You know, just, just a reminder. And, uh, and so his letter is very encouraging but once again, and it kind of goes through the different themes of, of God's work in the church and also in his community of believers. And, I, and right now, over the next few months, we, we are engaging in our community in prayer. We are gathering with other churches of, of, different, of different denominations, yet we're all praying to the same God. We're praying to the same God. And so we are working with our community. And Ephesians addresses different things of working with our community, the role of the church, and how the work of the church on this earth directly influences the balance of power in high places. Do you know that? The, the work that we do on this, on, this in, on this earth in the church directly affects the balance of power in high places. And so to, to, as we begin to look at Ephesians, Ephesians was written by Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus. And he wrote this letter in approximately 62 A.D. while he was a prisoner in Rome. Uh, you, you may re recall we, went, we just came from Jude, and Jude was written in approximately 65 to 70 A.D. So these are, he, this was written just a few years possibly before Jude wrote his letter. And so after spending a little more than two years uh, in, in Caesarea in a, in a prison, the apostle Paul was escorted to Rome by a centurion, and so he eventually arrives in the city where he spends time in a hired house while, while basically, basically on house arrest. And it was here that he, he writes his letter uh, to Ephesians and also to the church in Rome. He would finally be acquitted of, his, uh, of this. Or he, we would, he would await his trial and ultimately be acquitted in the spring of 63 A.D., only to turn and get rearrested and go back to jail in 67 A.D., where later he would be incarcerated or later be uh, beheaded by the Romans in May or June of 68 AD. So Paul, the last several years of his life, even though he's writing letters, encouraging letters like we're fixing to dive into, he wrote these letters from jail. And so, so often when we think, well, you know, that's easy for Paul to, to say, you know, this or that or whatever, we got to remember the circumstances of which he was living his life. We, we think sometimes we're being persecuted because we might not be able to go here or there. Paul was writing these letters from prison. For, for doing nothing but preach the truth. He was being persecuted for doing nothing but preach the truth. And so this letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus uh, was written really as, as a circular letter, is what, is what they would refer to as a letter that was to be circulated among the churches. Yes, it was directed especially and, and especially and specifically for the church in Ephesus, but it was also to be circulated among churches. There was so much in the book of Ephesians in this letter uh, that, that addresses so many different things for so many different churches. And so that the city of Ephesus, to kind of give you a little snippet of, of, what, the, of what Ephesians, the, the, the Ephesians were truly like, not just the, not the people in the church of Ephesus, but the, the city as a whole, the Ephesians. You see, the city of Ephesus was well known a well-known city, and it was known for its superstitious people. There were, many, there were cults, many cults and different types of, of things going on in the church, or not in the church, but in the, the city of Ephesus. Um, the cult of, of Artemis was so powerful that they erected the magnificent temple of Artemis, a structure that uh, Antipas would, would list among the seven wonders of the world. Her cult and, and mystery rites strongly, are strongly interpreted a worldview that would interpret life with, by astrology and magic and, and divination. Furthermore, the Ephesians were convinced that Zeus had sent the city a giant talisman, which they, scholars think is probably a meteor, but this talisman from the sky. And so facing this long-standing tradition of, of all this superstition and magic and false gods and cults and all this stuff that's going on in the city of Ephesians, it, um, it's, it's little to wonder why Paul's letter to the church contains one of the most extensive treatments of the church's role in the spiritual dimension. 
It's no wonder that his letter deals with, with spiritual wickedness in high places and deals with the heavenly realms and spiritual warfare and all these different things because of the spirits that they were fighting in this city. And so the apostle insisted that Christian holiness was to inform believers every day's relations, actions, words, and attitude. See, believers were not merely one of, of the many mystery cults of Ephesus, you know, with their, with their own rules and, all, and, and rights. See, they had, when people joined the church, they had joined an entity whose origin was eternity, a body whose head was now at the helm of the, all of the universe while leading that universe to victory. So the life of Christians, uh, the, the life Christians were to lead was, was rather a, a, a genuine response of love to Christ and the new nature we acquired upon receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul was letting these people know when you join the church, you're not joining another cult. It's not, it, it, yes, there are, there, there are standards, and yes, there are, there are holiness. There, it is a different lifestyle, but it's not all about rules. It's not like these cults that have all these crazy rules, and you're and why are we doing this, and why are we doing that? He said, you're, but it's joining it as a genuine response of love to Christ. Why do we live a life holy and pleasing to God? Because we love the God that gave his life for us. We are holy because he is holy. Uh, why, why are we here tonight? Because of a God that gave his life for us. It is a natural response to come to, to be in his house, to worship him, to love him. And that is why we're here. And so Paul's letter to the Ephesians is different compared to, to many others in the New Testament. Letters that he, that he specifically wrote. Once again, like, like Romans, Ephesians was not written so much to address problems in a particular church, but it was, it was more written to explain some of the great themes and doctrines of Christianity. And so his first two verses are a salutation or greeting that, that follows the etiquette for beginning any letter that you read in the New Testament. And so we'll begin reading tonight. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1. And it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uh, addresses his letter to the saints. So tonight I'm going to talk to the saints. <laughs> I told Brooke we ought to just start playing when the saints come marching in. Every Wednesday night when you come walking in, you just you march in, sit down, and we'll, and we'll talk to the saints. But the opening to his letter is very, it's very brief without, more, you know, without the, the more detailed greeting that, that you often find. In some of Paul's letters, he would have this very elaborate greeting. Um, however, it was very short. But there's little doubt that this letter was intended for Ephesus. Once again, Ephesus was a very important city to Paul. Paul spent, spent years there working uh, in the church in Ephesus, helping get an established pastoring, helping pastor that church some. And so he was very, uh, very attached to this church. His heart was with this church, and this was a, a place very dear to him. And so the term apostle, we see that once again he calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. The term apostle generally denotes one who is sent. However, once the, the early Christians acquired the term, they conferred upon its technical meaning referring to a, 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 a select group of, of, you know, of these uh, guarantors who, of authentic Christian doctrine and fellowship. And so Paul ascribed his apostleship to the will of God. He said, I, I, I'm apostle of, the, of, of Jesus Christ by the will of God. That, that is why I'm here. I am apostle only because I am following the will of God. And so and there was no human voice. There was no human that mediated God's calling on Paul's life. No, that mediated Paul's calling. It was God's calling. No, no person had called, Peter, called Paul to go and do this. It was God. And, 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 and who, who could argue <laughs> based on Paul's calling? If all, if all of us could have a calling like Paul where you're walking down the road and all of a sudden you're blinded by lighting and, and Jesus himself speaks to you, I think, I think Paul knew he was called. <laughs> there was no question as to whether or not he was called of God. And so Paul letting people know, I, I am an apostle of Christ. 
And so he uses, um, he uses this, this term saint as his audience. And saint is translated as a holy one. Is one who has been set apart for sacred service to God. He's talking to Christians, people that have, have set themselves apart. Apart from the world that have set themselves to, to be like God, to be holy like him. And people who are set apart from the world and living a lifestyle of holiness. That's the church in Ephesus. That's the church that Paul had invested years of his life. And so he knew these people were a holy people. That they had a holy lifestyle. This is who he was writing to. And so that's why he greets him in such manner. And so he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. This is the, a typical greeting from Paul. Because the apostle knew the essential place of grace and peace from God in the life of the believer. He knew that receiving God's grace comes before a walk in peace with him. Once again, we see a world that is filled with, with, with turmoil. There's, there's little peace out there. And we know that the only way we, we can have a walk of peace is first coming under the grace of God. When we come to him through repentance and, and, and accept his grace, then we can realize that we can live a life full of peace. We don't have to walk with turmoil. We don't have to walk a life with, with, with spirits and, and, and Satan always beating us up. No, we can walk under the grace of God and we can have a life of peace with him, only with him. We can't do it ourselves. I can't pick up this life and say, I don't need God. I can have peace on my own. That doesn't work. We only have peace when we walk with him. Verse 3 continues reading, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 3 here, here begins a comprehensive single sentence, 202 word eulogy. 202 words for the next four or five verses. It's all just one sentence. That's how I used to write. That's why I always failed English. I would just, every, it'd be like one sentence for like three paragraphs. <laughs> you know, just, you just keep bitting colons and commas and then we'll, we'll make it work. Uh, and so that's kind of what Paul, Paul here, here starts is this long comprehensive sentence. And he calls for a blessing upon the Father. Once again, this is in the sense of recognizing the, the glory and the honor and goodness of God. You know, we, we sing songs, you know, bless his name. We, we bless God. It's not that we're physically blessing him. But once again, it's, it's recognizing his blessings. It's giving honor to where honor is due. It's praising him, you know, play, you know, because the Father has already blessed the believer with every spiritual blessing. That's what it says. That he is all who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The idea here behind the blessed, the way he's using it, is praised with worshiping love. When we're blessing God, we're praising him with this worshiping love. Tonight we sang he loves us, and then we go right into, oh, how we love him. Because, because he first loved us. It said, who, hath, who has blessed us? See, this blessing is ours. God's resources are, are, are there for us always. And this, but this speaks of, of an attitude of certainty and assurance. He does, it doesn't say that who may have blessed us. No, he, when Paul's writing, he's, we're, I'm talking to the God who has blessed us. So if you ever have to wonder if you're blessed of God, the answer is yes. I can put, I can put all that aside. We are blessed. You are blessed. That's not a question we have to wonder about. And Paul addresses that and says, you know what? We are blessed. You are a blessed people. That is not something we have to wonder, well, why hasn't God blessed me yet? God has blessed you. If you have breath in your lungs, you are a blessed human being because you only have that breath because of God. Charles Spurgeon said this, we are not sitting here and groaning and crying and fretting and worrying and questioning our own salvation. He has blessed us, therefore we will bless him. If you think little of what God has done for you, you will do very little for him. But if you have a great notion of his great mercy to you, you will, be, you will be greatly grateful to your gracious God. I've never read a more truer statement. So often people that do so little for God, it's because they, they view how they don't realize the impact and, and the, gra the gravity of what God has done for them. I, I don't know if you know this, but without him, I would be nothing. Without him, I would be my way I would be on my way to a devil's hell. It is only because of him and his grace and his mercy. 
Why am I called of God? I don't know. He called me, but out of his grace, out of his goodness, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to stand here today, but God decided to call me. God decided to reach down and forgive me, a, a sinner just like everybody else, but for some reason God decided, God decided that we are, are somehow deserving of his grace and his mercy. Not that we've done anything because we, we can't earn his love. It's given freely. We can't earn mercy or grace. It's given freely. And I'm so thankful for that. He, he, when, he, when he talks about this in Paul writing, who has blessed us, he's writing to a church filled with both Jews and Gentiles. And so once again, l letting this church know that it, it, it's not just for Jews, it's not just for Gentiles, it is for everyone. We are all blessed. doesn't matter what, what, what the, you know, race you are, doesn't matter what color you are, doesn't matter how rich you are. We are all blessed. And we are all afforded the same opportunity to come to God through salvation. We can all come to him through an altar of repentance, through baptism in Jesus' name. The gift of the Holy Ghost is free to all. Doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, black or white, male or female, none of that matters with Christ. We can all come to him by the same means. And so Paul showed that these things are, are now given to Christians. Doesn't matter what you are. As long as you are a Christian, you are a child of God. He said, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So this, this describes both the kind of blessing and the location of those blessings. These are spiritual blessings, which I don't know if you know this, are, they, are, they are far better than any material blessings you'll ever get on this earth. Yes, we pray and we accept spiritual blessings and we accept physical blessings, but I would much rather prefer spiritual blessings over physical blessings any day because any material blessings that God decides to bless me with, one day that, that thing will, that, that will rot away. One day that thing will be no more. But any spiritual blessings that God blesses me with, those are eternal. Those are things that will be stored up in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so he tells us, once again, these blessings that he's, re he's referring to are spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So he's talking about blessings, once again, that, that one day we, we will have in heaven. Things that we are storing up for eternity. Because this life on earth is going to be very short. But one day when we get to heaven, we'll be able to enjoy all the blessings of which we were able to store up while on this earth. Once again, going back, don't forget that the things we do on this earth, they matter in eternity. What we invest and what we store up on while on this earth, whether we store it up on this earth or whether we store it up in heaven, it matters what we do while on this earth. One commentary writer penned these words, Our thanks are due to God for all temporal blessings. They are more than we deserve, but our thanks ought to go to God in thunders of hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. A new heart is better than a new coat. To feed on Christ is better than to have the best earthly food. To be an heir of God is better than to have the heir of the greatest nobleman. To have God for a portion is blessed, infinitely more blessed than to own broad acres of land. God hath blessed us with spiritual blessings. These are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings. They are priceless in value. I would rather have the blessings of God than any material blessing on this earth because they are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings, and they are priceless in value. You see, if we have no appreciation for spiritual blessings, then we live at the level of animals. Animals live they live only, only to eat and sleep and entertain themselves. That, that's it. So our, we are made in the image of God. We are made for something much higher, yet we have to choose to live above that. We can, we can sink and fall to an animal-like instinct. We've, we see that in our world. We see that animal-like instinct that comes out of people. We were not created to be animals. We were created... We were created for fellowship and communion with God. We are created to praise him. I, I am thankful that, that we are created in his image, not in the image of some animal or some beast. We are created in the image of God. Therefore, God wants us to know that every spiritual blessing is available to us 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we know that there is a, a heavenly realm in which our blessings in Christ are to be stored up. We also know there are other spiritual realms. Paul would later inform the Ephesians that God has appointed his church to the task of challenging the dark spiritual rulers in these spiritual realms because the work of the church on earth directly influences the balance of power in high places. Ephesians 1 and 4, we'll continue reading. It says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein, we hath, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. You see, what, what God elects is not determined by the pressures and progressions of time. So often we, we, we think time, you know, time is something that is, Yes, it is something that is rare, something we can't reproduce. But sometimes God, when he refers to time, it's, it's a lot further out than we might think. You know, when he made, when prophets would come and make, uh, make the declarations of the Messiah and that he was coming, it would, it would be hundreds of years before that would ever happen. Yet it gave generations hope that one day there would be a Messiah. We're on, the, we're on the flip side of that. We know that, that God sent the Messiah, that he came, robed himself in flesh, that he came to this earth, that he gave his life for us. And now here we are wait, awaiting his return. We know he will return. That's not something we're debating. We know that God will return one day. Yet here we are finding ourselves in the same boat that some of them were where they were waiting. <laughs> That's where we are. We're in a place of waiting and watching. And I want to continue to be watching, watching and preparing and make sure that I am ready for his coming. But here it, it talks about, it says, as beloved Israel was elected in eternity, so, so was Christ elected before the foundation of the world. You see, our, our, our election proceeds directly from the election of Christ before the beginning. See, according to Paul, by, by virtue of belonging to the chosen Israel, Israelites were God's adopted sons. Similarly, Christians, by virtue of belonging to Christ, that's what he says, in him, that we are, we are in him. We are the adopted sons of God. Paul uses the term pleasure and beloved, which in the earliest Christian circles became descriptive of the Son of God. And this echoes the Father's declaration at Jesus' baptism in Matthew three seventeen, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here the full significance of a blessing addressed to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. As an Israelite's favor with God was dependent upon Israel's favor with God. So a Christian's favor with God derives solely from the Father's favor toward his beloved Son. Now let me stop and say this. This, this is partially, uh, you, see, you saw the word predestinated. This is partially where the doctrine of predestination comes from. You, see, you find more of it in, in, in Romans which teaches that God inf inf infallibly guides those who are destined for salvation. And you see that, and you see the talk of being predestinated once again in, in Paul's letter to the Romans. But predestination is a doctrine that, that events have been willed by God, usually with reference to it, this fate or an individual soul. And this is often used to teach that it doesn't necessarily matter how you live or what we do because God has only predestinated those who will be saved and those who will not. And in no sorts is that biblical. And nowhere in Scripture is that biblical. Yes, we see the word predestined, but often that is taken out of context to be contorted to say, well, you can do what you want. It doesn't matter. God has, you know, he's, he's already elected or predestined those who are going to be damned to hell and those who are going to make it to heaven. Therefore, it doesn't matter what we do because God's already made that election. But let me tell you what the Bible does say. John eleven twenty five 25, and 26 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believeth in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. 
do you believe this? Everyone, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. It doesn't say Jews or, or, or Gentile. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all. To all. That doesn't mean that God is, once again, why, why would he die for all if he's already predestined some, some over here and some over here? No, he died for all. It is God's will that all. 1 John 2 and 1, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the, 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 the prop, prop, I can't even say it, propitiation. I'm, I can't, I'm still saying it. <laughs> propitiation, I'm going to forget it, uh, <laughs> for our sins. <laughs> I read it right today, and now I can't get it out. <laughs> and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And, it, and if you say, well, well that, that you may be, well, let me read you this. Second Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the word of God. That's scripture. So if if you ever wonder, if you've ever kind of consider what is it what is it saying there? It's not saying what this doctrine of predestination teaches. Because we know that he his will is that all should come to repentance. That, that none should perish. That's what Scripture says. That's what Scripture teaches. It continues on that we should be holy without blame before him in love. We are, we are chosen. We are, if you will, predestined to be holy. Chosen, set apart, determined to be holy and without blame before him. The word holy and without blame relate to the, to the perfect and, and immaculate sacrifices which the law required people to bring to the altar of God. See, God desires us to be holy, to be pure, to live holy, to be blameless, not only before him, but before all men. See, holiness is a lifestyle that God desires and requires us to have. Holiness is not an option. Holiness is not, holiness as a lifestyle is not an option. Hebrews 12 and 14 tells us exactly this. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Two things he lets us know without we won't see the Lord, peace and holiness. Peace and holiness. Without peace and holiness, we shall not see the Lord. You cannot, and you cannot forget the word that at the end of this little phrase he made. He said, in love. We are to be blameless and we are to be holy in love. Holiness and blameless are nothing without love. Can I get an amen? I, I've seen people that are holy to every, you cross every T, dot every I. Yeah, that's right. Make sure I say dot, dot and cross right. They, they, they got the holiness life, you know, the, the, the outside right, but there's no love in them. That's not holiness. They, they just know how to wear a dress or, or, wear, or, or, or wear whatever we decide to wear. But once again, that, that is in no way holiness because holiness is a matter of the heart. Because the outside can look the part and it not be right on the inside. That's not holiness. But when you have holiness on the inside, when you have true godly holiness on the inside, the outside will reveal it. Because if the inside's right, the outside has to reveal it. When we have pure and true holiness, because once again, we can dress the outside up to look holy all day long without having it on the inside. And so, once again, Paul, he's not hitting issues here. He's just praising God and reminding them why we should be holy and why we should be blameless because God has saved us, because God has chosen us and called us, because he died for us and he has made a way for us to be saved. 
He continued in verse 5, having predestined, pre, predestinated us to the, into the adoption of, of children by Jesus Christ to himself. You know, once again, God's unfolding plan for us uh, not only includes salvation and personal transformation, but is also a, a warm and confident relationship with the Father. When we come, when, we, when he call, his call to us is not just so that he can save us. It's not just so that he can fill us with the Holy Ghost and then wave goodbye and we go live our lives. His plan is for us to come in and have communion with him. He wants a, a relationship with each and every one of us. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him. God wants you. He wants to know your, your, your concerns. He wants to know what's going on in your life. We say, well, he already knows, but he wants you to tell him. <laughs> he wants to have communion with you. He wants to hear you say it. And once again, we have to, why are we, why are we praying out here Saturday? Because we're praying for God's will to come into existence. We're praying his will into existence. Yes, God, God would love for revival to fall, but he's waiting for his people to follow his will and pray it into existence. So we're going to get out here and we're going to pray. It's the same thing once again. God, God, he, he, he has so much more in store for us than many ever venture into. Because so often we, we, we think, well, as long as I can get the salvation part checked off, then I'm good. I can just show up, sit on a pew, and everything's good. God wants us to go so much deeper than just sitting on a pew. God desires to draw us so much deeper than just coming and warming a pew. So we, we, serve, we serve a good father, and he desires the very best for his children. My father, he, he always pushed me to do more. I'm sure there are others that you could say, well, yeah, my father, he pushed me to, to do more, to go further, to go do something else. You know, our, our heavenly father pushes us to do more. He desires for us to step out, to continue to go deeper, to do more in his service because, you know, we know the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He wants his children to go out. He wants his children to work. He wants his children to labor. And I'm glad that he loves us even when we don't deserve it. There's times that my father has loved me even when I didn't deserve it. Yet our heavenly father, even, even the more, he loved us before we ever loved him. He loved us before we were ever formed. You see, and, and what makes this, this whole thing, you know, talking about adoption, when he talks about adoption here, in Roman law in this time, when the adoption was complete, it was, it was, if, if it was as complete as it can be. And what I mean is, is the person who had been adopted had all the rights of a legitimate son in his new family and completely lost all rights in his old family. See, in the eyes of the law, he was a new person. So, and, and, and so new <laughs> that even all debts and obligations that were connected with his previous family were abolished as if they had never existed when somebody adopted someone. That, that's, under, that's under Roman law in this time. So you see why he uses the term adoption here. It's talking about something that is so new. You're coming into a new family. That old family is cut away. That, that old life is gone. Those old debts are gone. All that stuff you couldn't afford to pay, that, that, that price we couldn't pay, is gone. It's abolished. because It's as if it never existed. One commentary writer took it a step further. He said, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are not adopted into the family of God. They are born into the family. The Greek has only one word, and it is son place. We are placed in the position of the sons. Hence why we are born again when we come into the, the body of Christ. When we, when we come to him, we are, we are born again through repentance. And we're born again when we take on his name through baptism. You see, he continues on, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The relational aspect is, is emphasized again as Paul describes the status of accepted or highly favored or full of grace is what he's talking about here. Once again, talking about this, this, this relationship that God desires to have with us and that is granted to, to every believer because of God's grace. See, Paul realized that this plan gave glory to the grace of God. By the, by the giving of the law, God's justice and holiness were rendered most glorious but by the giving of the gospel, his grace and mercy were made equally glorious. God's plan in the gospel is often rejected 
because it glorifies God and his grace and not the effort or achievement of men. Many in our world are looking, looking for something that glorifies them. It glorifies their achievement. It glorifies their talent. But that's not, that's not the gospel message. The gospel message is when we bring our talents and our abilities and we use them for him and it's not about us. It's not about our glory. It's not about our talents or abilities. But it's how we use ourselves to honor him. I'm, I'm going to ask our musicians to come in closing tonight once again. I'm glad that God has accepted me into his kingdom. I'm glad that God has accepted a wretched sinner like me. Once again, we, we, every, one of, every one of us here tonight has fallen short of the glory of God. We are all saved by grace. We are all saved by grace. There's not a person here that has lived a perfect life. There's not a person here that is deserving or worthy of heaven. Not, not I, not you. But I'm thankful for the call of God on my life. I'm thankful that God still calls and uses people in the midst of, of their faults, in the midst of, yes, we, we have failures, yet he still calls us and he still uses us. When I read through Scripture, most of his Bible, or all of the Bible, except for, except for Jesus Christ himself, is stories about people that seemingly didn't have it all together, but God was willing to use them anyways. People that doubted and feared and messed up and had all kinds of craziness going on, yet for some reason God decided to call them anyways. God decided to use them anyways. In the midst of fear, in the midst of doubt, God still called and God still used. And I hope and I know that God can still do the same today. That he can come down and find people that, yeah, we might not have it all together, but God's, God's still willing to use us. No matter where you find yourself in life, God can use you. And he desires to use you. And he wants a relationship with you. But it requires us to make that step. I can't make you live for God. I can't make you grow. That's where our choice comes in. That's where we step up to the plate and say, you know what, God? I'm going to do this. Not for me, not for my glory, but for you. And so tonight as you stand... I wonder if we can do like Paul said and bless the Lord tonight before we live the, leave this place. So if we can lift our hands, I've asked them to come up and sing tonight for just a moment. And I wonder if we can lift our hands and I wonder if we can sing and bless his name tonight before we leave this place. Dear Lord, we love you, God. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. For God, we love you. God, we love you tonight. And we thank you for what you're going to do in this place. God, right now as we praise your mighty name, God, I ask that your spirit would come down. Lord, let it rest upon us, Lord. God, we worship and we praise you, Jesus, for who you are. God, we're not worthy. I'm not worthy of your mercy nor your grace. But God, I sure thank you for it. God, I praise you for it. I thank you for what you're doing in my life for the life of everyone here tonight. Amen. I want you to sing this with our praise team tonight. We love you. Do you love them tonight? going to sing that one more time. One more time before we leave tonight. If we can lift our hands, let's just worship him. Let's pour our love on him. He is so worthy. So many times he's brought me through. So many times he saved my life. He is so worthy of my love.
Lord, because you first loved us. Amen, amen. Carry that song with you this week. While you're driving down the road, why don't you just start singing it? I know it's a simple song, an old song, but I love driving down the road and just singing those old songs, reminding myself of how much I love him. So often I find myself singing that old song, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Because I need him. I can't make it in this world without him. Amen. So good to have all of you tonight. I thank you for coming. Thank, thank all those that are joining us by way of the web. Once again, please be here Saturday at 6 p.m. in the parking lot. Uh, we'll, be, we'll direct you as you pull in. But come and help us pray for our revival for our country. And then we hope to see you Sunday at 1130. There is no Sunday school on Sunday. One service at 1130 here in the sanctuary as we honor our Sunday school teachers and promote our children. Once again, thank you for being here. God bless you. You are dismissed this evening.